everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Sheridan Ganger, Director of Marketing here at HelpShift. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this morning. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by Matt Fairchild. Matt, thank you so much for being here. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, I wanted to give our audience a little bit of insight into why we've been having these webinars. Uh, we've hosted, this will be our fourth webinar in 28 days, um, and this is what we're calling our Roadshow to GDC. So with GDC just around the corner, um, we a couple months ago when we were thinking about what, we should, what should we do at GDC, we wanted to do something different. Right? We, we didn't want to you know, do the whole sponsorship at the event. You know, we didn't want to you know, do some other things that are more traditional. So we thought, why not have a summit? So we decided to host a summit on March 4th at the St. Regis, which will be called the More Summit, which will be around user engagement and retention. Something a little bit different that you haven't been seeing at the last conferences in the past. We will be having Dean Takahashi be our moderator, where we'll, we will be inviting a handful of industry experts, such as Matt, right. to join a couple of panels to really talk about the importance of user engagement and user retention. So I'm looking very much forward to that. And because of that summit, we decided, why not have a webinar roadshow to invite some of the participating panelists and other industry experts to come and share their insight into a variety of topics around gaming. So the first webinar that we hosted was with Glue, and we discussed the optimizing the free-to-play model and really how do you get your users to start paying in your game. Uh, you know, with the success they've had with Kim Kardashian game, we really got to uncover what has been working with them. And if you've checked out their stock prices, you know that they're getting it right. So it was great to have Glue here for our first webinar as we kicked off the roadshow. And second webinar, we hosted Luminary, which just launched their new game, Greedy Goblins. So we sat down with Amir Abrahimi, who's a CEO and co-founder of Luminary, to really discuss the step-by-steps that go into launching a game and what you need to be thinking about after launch. Um, so that was a great event. And then last week, we kind of pivoted, and we invited the founder of Musi to come and join us and talk about App Store optimization. You know, people rush to get their app out. They just are so excited to ship their app that they forget some critical steps to make sure that your app is optimized for downloads in the App Store. So Aaron uncovered the hacks and the tips and tricks that he used to secure five-star ratings across the board. So that was a great event. And if you missed it, it's up on our blog, so be sure to check it out. And today, we're here for our fourth webinar to talk about community. And that's why Matt is here. Matt is the director of community at TinyCo, which has a very successful game, Family Guy, The Quest for Stuff. Yes, you got the V. Yes, I did get the V. And the success of this game really comes down to Matt's dedication and his team to make sure that their players are constantly engaged, constantly happy, and part of the TinyCo family. So we're thrilled that you are here today to talk about the three critical channels to increase LTV and really how to engage your players on a day-to-day -day basis. So Matt, thank you so much for being here. I know that was a little bit more of a, a long-winded welcome, but we really wanted to give our audience an insight to why we're having this roadshow. So Matt, any, any, any opening comments? Yeah, like thank, thank you so much for having me and uh, Sheridan just recently invited me to the summit and I'm really, really excited to be participating. Uh, in part because it's what you were talking about that there's uh, there's a lot of words out there about acquisition and retention and the marketing, but ult ultimately what this summit sounds like it's about and what I'm uh, preparing to talk about is how do you make players happy and how do you keep them around? So you've already got them in there, but if you're not making them happy, then what, why are you drawing them into your app in the first place? Absolutely. And uh, we've, uh, um, and yeah, it's, it's going to be fantastic. And I believe you were telling me that everybody that's on the stream now is getting an invite. Absolutely. So we want to welcome all of our audience members today to join us at this, what we're calling the MORE Summit, the Mobile Retention and Engagement Summit, which will be held on March 4th at the St. Regis, beginning at 9.30 a.m. Um, we're partnering with Venture Read, and as I mentioned, Dean Takahashi will be there giving us a very warm welcome and monitoring some of the panels. So it should be a great event, and we'll be sure to follow up um, in an email with all of those details post-webinar. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, and thank you for having me. Great. So Matt, let's get into it. 
you have mastered building a community for Tiny Co. And the audience wants to learn kind of this secret sauce. So we've come up with a couple of questions that will really help uncover, you know, how Matt and his team have really kind of moved the needle when it comes to building a community. So where should people start? Like where's kind of the stepping stone, um, whether or not you're an indie shop or you're, let's say the more larger companies like the glues in the world, like how do you, how should people start thinking about community? Well, Lynn, I'd, uh, I'd like to start by like throwing it out to my team, and that's not just the community team, but the the entire Family Guide Quest for Stuff team, where as we were building up the community department at TinyCo, our founding principle basically was that the entire company was going to be a part of the community team. Uh, we have a, a very strong philosophy that whether you're on product, whether you're on biz dev, uh, QA, that all of it ultimately goes back to the people that sign our paychecks, which is Absolutely. our players. And so we have people working almost literally around the clock to come out with content, to sign new deals, to try to uh, develop the game, keep the servers up, and all of that ties back to this feedback loop that we build with players uh, over time. And the, the nice thing is when you're indie, when you're, when you're a smaller company, that means that the, the circle that you have that feedback with is much smaller. Like you can have the CEO uh, sitting there answering emails late into the, until the nights, and we, uh, we even had that for a while. Where I remember when I first started at TinyCo, it was uh, me and the CEO answering emails. And it eventually it's a point where you, you reach a point of scale that not everybody can be focused on customer support at all times. And as you have more uh, player engagement, you want to make sure that everybody is responding in an even manner. But then uh, as the team grows, how do you take that feedback and uh, distribute it throughout the company? So we end up, so really the difference between uh, indie and somebody at a larger scale is how do you have this reporting process? Like if the CEO is not in there reading the emails directly, how do you make sure that, uh, that they know everything that they're supposed to know about that? How does the product team have everything that they have to know from that one? And how is it translated into a way that you can actually action? Great, great, and, and we'll, we'll be getting into more nitty gritty as, as we go, but you know, one thing that we hear a lot when we hear the word community is that people think of it as a kind of a cost center, right? You know, it's just more heads in the table, you know, it's more people involved, more paychecks, mm -hmm. but it actually is a revenue center because they're there to keep the players happy, engaged, and spending money. So how should people think about this model and not see it as just a cost center, but really a revenue center? And, and it goes deeper than that, where it ties, the reason why we distribute it throughout the company is because it ties into, uh, it, it'll increase your K factor for the game, that if you have people that are talking about it online, uh, it will drive down the cost of user acquisition as they tell their friends about it. Uh, we regularly poll our players, like, how did you hear about us? How did you hear about, this? How, about us? Why do you play this? And uh, well, I wish I had the exact number for you right now. A very non-trivial number, say, a friend of mine told me about it after hearing about it through whatever channel. And this ends up being something that uh, we can feed back into itself. Um, it plays into the product roadmap that if uh, it's getting really, really crowded on the gaming marketplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if y'all have launched a game lately, you know that, that there's a bunch of big entrants that are spending a lot of money on acquiring new users, and there's thousands of uh, independent players that have really fantastic ideas that they're just trying to get exposure for. And when everybody is competing in the, this uh, growing marketplace, it's how you engage with those players that lets you stand out. And they're going to be telling you how to make your game better. They're going to be, and what's really challenging is they won't always be telling you about this. Uh, I could be talking to you about a game and I could say, you know what, I really wish the game did this. And if they did, I would probably play a lot more. And you'd say, yeah, that'd be awesome. I actually quit playing last week because it uh, took too long to do this mm -hmm. thing. And so um, one, of, uh, one of our goals there is just to be present where everybody is talking to one another to encourage them to talk to one another because they don't even have to be talking to us about it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, grab that feedback and deliver it to the product team for something that uh, ends up driving revenue or retention or allowing players to stick around longer down the line. Absolutely, and we'll definitely get into that kind of meeting your player at that point of need and when is the right time to ask for feedback later in the webinar. But, you know, the community industry is divided on whether or not you guys are part of support, if you guys are part of product. Like, you guys kind of get your feet wet and everything, but the, it's all about the community, as you said. It's kind of everybody within the business. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It, this, is, this is really important in the community industry right now. Uh, it goes back to... Uh, 
the community managers are a relatively recent job title. There's people that have been doing it for 20 years, but it's recently been exploding with the sharing economy and with gaming and with mobile in particular. Uh, but there's always been a difficulty with job description that over and over again, a community manager joins and then gets handed a customer support team. It's like, this this isn't what I applied for. Yeah. Like, I applied for this and this and this. And uh, so there's, there's a million different ways to do it. Community can work on marketing. It can work on product. It can work on operations. Uh, for what works for us and what we believe strongly for gaming is that a community management, customer support, and social media are all closely, closely tied together. And we merge that as any time that uh, players are talking, we want to be talking with them. And so customer support is another one of those where players are talking directly to you, and they're also going to go out there and share with their friends what their customer support experience was. They're especially going to do that if it was a bad one. And so uh, the, the, other, the other advantage that support has is it's really metrics driven. So in using uh, in tying the support team to uh, the community team and having some specialization within the departments, but having them all sit at the same pods, all talk to one another, all in the same chat channel, sharing information. Uh, you get the metrics that you uh, strengthen the customer support mm -hmm. department, while also having the positive feedback loops that drive a community-driven company. Can you get into a little bit about the metrics that you guys want to look at at Tiny Co? Like, what are kind of the top KPIs that you guys measure? Absolutely. Uh, we so we look at things like uh, average tickets coming in per thousand users. Um, this lets us decouple it from maybe we just had like a bunch of people join the game, like we like we added Arnold Schwarzenegger last week because why not? There Arnold you go. Schwarzenegger <laughs> is awesome. Uh, but if there's an issue that coincides with that, is it because? Uh, there was actually a problem that was driving it, or maybe just everybody wanted to log on to get Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but so we uh, look at that one. We also uh, look at, um, and so we look at average playing time. We look at the age of the user, where we found that there is a very different suite of things that people talk about when they've been playing the game for less than a week mm -hmm. versus when they've been playing the game for three or four months. And those two buckets right there end up together making up more than 50% of our support tickets. Wow. Like you are overwhelmingly likely either to be over level 40 in our game or under level 10 or wow. under seven days old. And uh, by simply looking at those as they come in or looking at them as they start talking on the, uh, with, from the players, it gives us indications for how we're doing. Um, we look at how many people are writing into us via email because the 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 channel that people use dictates the kind of issues that the game might be running Absolutely. into. And then uh, the other thing we work on is we work heavily with our content producers and our influencers to run polls. Um, one of our favorite ones is just how are we doing? Like, how was our last event? How would you rate us on a scale of 1 to 10? And then uh, outside of the top line metric, like how many fives or tens did we get, we look at the shape of the graph. Like, do we have more people that are giving us a four or five than we do that are giving us a one, two, or three combined? And based on that, we can pull the way that people are talking to one another and look at that sentiment analysis and combine it with, like, if more people are giving you those lower rankings and we're giving you the higher one, they might say really nice things, but it means that they just met that they uh, were not as engaged with it as they could have been. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Thank you so much for that. Like, and that was very valuable to everybody on the call is you're thinking about you know, building out your community and, and what kind of metrics you should be thinking about. And the other, the, the thing we always try to tell people with metrics is we, we, we love the top line metrics. We love Facebook likes. We love uh, registered users. Um, but those, those are numbers that should all just by definition be going up into the right. Yep. So they're great for uh, using them internally to gather resources and make everybody feel really proud about accomplishments. Uh, we're hoping to hit a million likes on our Facebook page really soon. But we also like to be really honest with ourselves that we can, that there's a lot of ways to get likes. The really hard stuff is comments and shares. Absolutely. And um, we also want to know like how many times are the same people commenting over and over. Uh, we found out that, uh, like on the support side, two thirds of people who write into support are writing in for the first time and never write in again. So how do we make sure that as they do that, that they come away with the most positive interaction that they possibly can? 
Great, Matt, that's wonderful. And I'm just gonna take a minute to remind people, this is an invite, but we want this to be really interactive and we wanna hear, oh, and our lights just went off. Uh, yes. we, we wanna hear from the audience on the call. So if you guys have any questions, please use the hashtag AskHelpShift on Twitter and we have our experts working in the background to make sure that those questions are answered. So, um, and Matt and I will get to some Q&A at the end. So, when in our conversations, we've talked a lot about how players spend and how much money people are playing in your game can kind of affect the way that you guys manage your support and, and kind of how you can increase that spend while keeping your players ultimately happy. Because, you know, we talk, we use the word user, but at the end of the day, they're a person. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're spending money with your game because they enjoy it. So, you know, how does that kind of incorporate into the community strategy? I'm gonna briefly tangent there. Okay. You just touched on like my favorite thing in the entire world, uh, which is just language. Okay. Like we, when we establish the team, uh, we believe that the language that you use to describe things dictates your internal thoughts about something. Yes. And so uh, we have led a campaign within the company that we said, all right, they're not users anymore, they're players. We, they play our game. Uh, and it just, it has that immediate like reframing um, I make it a point to correct people right when they join the company, you know, politely, like I want them to, to feel good about this, but saying, no, these are our players, these are people that are on the other side of it. Um, but spend is uh, important, mostly uh, it's because we're in the free-to-play genre. Yep. Uh, the industry standard across the, across the, the industry standard across the industry uh, is that in free-to-play, 5% of your users will ever spend any amount of non-zero money. Um, and those players end up, uh, they, they allow us to keep the lights on. And that means uh, when a prep, you, so you have a certain bucket of comments or tickets that are coming in, um, you have a responsibility to make sure that the people that are driving the game for the rest of the community are ridiculously happy. Yeah. Now, the question beyond that is we want everybody to be ridiculously happy. So how can we make sure when we're dealing with this order of scale that we are both uh, making sure that everybody who has made a purchase is really, really happy with their purchase. And we have the ability to see that, where the, like a support ticket comes in, and we prioritize those while also having a team that is working on uh, the feedback and the, the non-payer mm -hmm. issues. Um, and it's, it's ultimately that, that tail that bikes the dog thing, mm -hmm. that uh, how, do we, how do we divide it into answering these tickets while also answering all tickets mm -hmm. and trying to provide this support at scale? Um, so yeah, it does matter, but it's also making sure that that's not the only tickets Absolutely. that we're answering. Um, that's why we look at the other buckets. That's why we look at uh, players who are at high level, because if you've never spent a dime, but you've been playing with us since April, which is when uh, the game launched, like, we love you. <laughs> we, we want you to keep doing that. Like, please, please keep playing. You probably know more about the game than, uh, like, people, than, like people that have been playing since April and having this as part of their lives, they end up knowing more about it than the developer does. Wow. And we want to hear their thoughts on uh, how do we make features that really excite people for the game down the line. And that leads perfectly into my next question. Why is the direct line of communication with your players so important when it comes to scaling your community? It's, it, there, there's, I feel like it's two reasons. Like one of them, one of them's obvious, and one of, one of them is not. Like the direct line of communication is because they're going to talk no matter what you do. They're yeah. uh, they're going to have conversations. They're going to uh, be excited or complain. We hope it's more the the former than the latter. But we also say like if it's the latter, that's awesome. Like please please let us know the complaints. We're only distraught if we screw something up and nobody tells us that we screwed up because that means nobody's playing anymore. Like, if you well, if you know how we can improve the game, we we want to hear about that. And if you love it, we want to hear that too. Um, but it's so that you can get that feedback that's happening anyways and allow you to make better product decisions. Uh, but the other one is it allows you, it's because you don't know what's gonna happen yet. Yeah. So what has changed in mobile gaming uh, is you now hear about games as a service. Um, we, we consider Family Guide and Quest for Stuff to be event-based. Mm -hmm. Like it is a game that you play over a long period of time and then you get surprised when something, like we're in our Valentine's Day event right now. And it uh, completely changes several of the mechanics on the game. The players can go on dates, it's adorable. Um, <laughs> and when you're releasing this new stuff over time, over the course of years, uh, you might not like. We have our idea of what a roadmap uh, of what the roadmap mm -hmm. is, but the roadmap is never going to survive contact with the players mm -hmm. because 
they have very strong ideas about what they want to play, and it's in our best interest to give players what they want to play. Uh, so what having that direct line of communication gives you is uh, it protects you down the line either when you make a choice that you need to change, when you need to pivot a feature, mm -hmm. or uh, when you're trying to roll something out across the wider player base. So basically, you're constantly talking to players so that when you really need them, like if something breaks or if you need to manage a diff difficult message, instead of uh, taking to the like the popular metaphors, torches and pitchforks. Okay. And this is what I hear from developers that are really worried about engaging with their communities. What if they get angry when you make a mistake? I'm like, no, you talk to your players yeah. Yeah. before you make a mistake. And then when you make a mistake and you fix it, they will be so happy. They will be so excited that uh, you worked with them to bring back this thing that is really important. And uh, like ultimately, I feel a little uncomfortable like using the they word. Yeah. Like this is something we try to be careful about. Where some something we talk to both sides. We consider ourselves the face of players, the tiny co, and the face of tiny co to the players. Is that we're all on the same team. Like if something breaks, nobody's nobody's having a good day. And if things are going well, everybody's having a good day. And so how uh, how can we align players to help us out with that? And it means that if you wait until something's broken, you're you're going to be all alone, yeah. and uh, you're going to get yelled at. Whereas if you're constantly having that direct line of communication, even just asking them, like, how was your day? Asking your influencers, uh, how did this go? Like, sending handwritten cards and pictures and gifts. Handwritten um, cards and gifts. Handwritten, handwritten cards are awesome. This is the, the widely known community tool at this point, and there's actually a lot of services that you can uh, get help sending it out to mailing addresses. Do you have an example of a service? Um, I could we can send one out okay. afterwards. I don't awesome. have it on hand, but they're they're getting out there. Right. And uh, but things that make people feel valued means that when something goes wrong, everybody is then on your side and helping you fix it. Absolutely, and that you really just uncovered like bringing that human aspect back into gaming, right? You, you're giving right. your players a face. You're giving them that kind of that personality that's really helping TinyCo grow their business. The, the greatest thing that I hear, and it, it, I, I, I want to cry at my desk from joy whenever I read this, uh, is when we either get an email or a comment or something from a player that says other companies don't do this. And that's the nice thing about the community industry right now is odds are your competitors are not talking to their users. Uh, very few companies mm -hmm. do this. A lot of companies think they do this, but even then they have it very like if your department is not part of every other department at the company, you're not really giving them a voice. Whereas we want to be present at every single channel. If if there's a Facebook group, we want to be in the Facebook group reading and commenting. Um, if there's comments on our Facebook page, we want to be there. If there's a subreddit, we want to be there. If there's a fan-driven forum, then um, we often uh, will see a fan-run blog that will post a critical post. And there'll be a whole bunch of comments that say, you know what, I agree with this post. We'll hop in there and we'll either we'll say one of two things. We'll either say, thank you so much for this, we're going to talk about changing it. Mm -hmm. Or we'll say, thank you so much for this, here's why we made the decision that we did. And in presenting the, in having transparency with the thought process behind the decision, um, it allows players to agree or disagree with the process mm -hmm. rather than the outcome. And it also indicates to them that we intend to be here for the long haul. Like we want to be here months and years from now and that there is no single choice in the game that uh, they don't have a hand in. I like that process rather than outcome. I think that's that's a great lesson to be learned. And that ties into kind of the next kind of phase of the webinar. You know, games are played everywhere. People play them everywhere at all times. How can you be with your player at every point of need? That That is what is completely different now. That uh, now players on mobile games, it used to be that like I come up from a console gaming background and you either sit on a couch or hang out with friends and you're playing there and it has your attention. Whereas now the game is everywhere. Like you are as likely to be playing in the grocery store or in the uh, or, or on on the train going to work. You're you're in this heavily distracted mode. And it also has this thing where there's push notifications from other games that are trying to pull you in. Um, it's a fundamentally distracted thing. But we see that as an as an advantage because it's with you at all times. Like you can start building these really positive and happy habits that, um, like before, like when I'm on the train, like now I can check and make progress towards this thing and unlocking a character. And on the game development side, it's how do you build up these these happy rituals? How do you have 
uh, somebody like feel excited about pulling out their phone and getting a positive thing there. On the community side, it, it, you get exactly the same thing. Like Facebook is really becoming fantastic, at least for us as a community platform, because they invest heavily in being everywhere. Uh, there's yeah. risks, yeah. like they uh, just like in the old days when Google changed their SEO. Um, that would affect your search rankings. Now you have Facebook's algorithm to deal with as well. Uh, the, the secret right now is if you're not posting videos on your Facebook channel, you should be, because it's really heavily rewarded by Facebook at this point. People love videos. I know I love videos. The, the yeah. auto-scroll is a huge, huge yeah. thing. Like, we uh, we spotted that. Um, there, it, there was a lot of information going around about that, but then we realized we have two things with Family Guy. We have the joke asides in the game, mm -hmm. or in the TV show that we can post, and we also have like, the in-game character animations. Um, but And that immediately drove up our engagement on the page. But back to community, <laughs> it's that now somebody can be on their phone and talk to a friend about the game within the confines of a group. And that by distributing this community over a bunch of different channels, by having uh, Reddit and Facebook and all of these existing platforms that people already talk mm -hmm. on. Uh, Twitter would be another example, of course, that it allows you to be present in when players want to give you their downtime, that you can allow them to do that and build a platform based on the downtime that they give you. Great. Wonderful, Matt. And you know, this this has been great for the audience and, and great for me as I'm learning more about the whole gaming industry. So thank you. And as a reminder, please use the hashtag AskHelpShift uh, if you have any questions as Matt starts going into his more detailed answers. Um, so Matt and I met yesterday and we were kind of talking about today's event and one thing that struck me is very different in terms of talking to other people throughout you know, this different webinar series is that you at TinyCo are very liberal with giving credits if people yes. have a problem. You have no problem giving free things away to keep your players happy. So what's the advantage for a company to you know not be stingy and you know give back to the players that are having problems. The so when somebody new joins the team, like there there's a couple of things that we teach in the first day. The first is to go talk to other people in the company, mm -hmm. um, and then the other is that uh, you will not get in trouble for giving too many things away. Um, and then we so we there there are exceptions like there will, there will be players that ask for very large amounts. <laughs> um, we'll we'll talk to them, <laughs> but. Um, there's like giving, you can always come up, the, basically the goal is to have the player come away happy. And there's a lot of tools at your disposal in order to do that. Um, so giving away premium currency, like as a small amount that gives you progress in the game, it feels valuable. Um, you have to be careful because when you're giving away a currency, it's, uh, it's something that's called an extrinsic reward, which is a really, really big driver. Like if you ever want to like, if you ever want to get a lot of people to respond to something, just offer them five dollars to do it. Uh, but it is less valuable engagement than if you give them like a thing. Like it's even better to uh, give them an item within the game, or give them. Uh, it's one of the one of the secrets actually is can you give them status within their community? And we try to be really liberal with that as well. Where like on our main channels, uh, we post about our fan blogs and our fan content because. We, we could give them a great uh, a great deal of clams, but that's ultimately less valuable than uh, posting in front of a larger audience as the creators of the game, so you already have a fair amount of status there. And then uh, spreading that status to other people ends up being a significantly greater reward. Um, on the support side, it's that like we try to ask our agents to delight one person a day. And so it kind of knocks you out of that mind of, all right, we want to help people at scale. There's there's a lot of tickets and email to get through, and we want everybody to be happy. But also, like, pause, read. What is this person really asking? And it might be uh, we we had somebody just send us a photo of their new puppy, and then we had another person send us a photo of two kangaroos in their backyard. Right. And we were like, thank you so much. You just made our, you just made the entire team's day. We would like to make your day as well. And so here's this uh, here's here's a token amount of gifts from us, and that. Um, like keeping that player around is ultimately much, much, much more valuable than trying to document the number of the amount that you're giving away. That's great. And that makes people happy. And, you know, one of the things that we also talked about was that, you know, people talk about positive support experiences. Yeah? They, they, they brag to their friends, they go on social media. If you give them a positive experience, if you give them something, 
it's going to really help increase the virality of your game. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, and like, so most the most support departments have, uh, we, we all know that more people talk about negative experiences than mm -hmm. positive, but sometimes that gets used as reaching a minimum viable support where you're just trying to not be negative. Um, we, we see opportunity in the positive support mm -hmm. experience as well. Um, and one of the ways that we've been trying to apply that is thinking a lot about how can we provide a positive support experience or a positive community, uh, like a community interaction when the answer is in the negative. So like I'll be hopping onto a community thread about an unpopular decision and how can we, how can we make people come away from that feeling like they had been heard? Where the answer might still be like we need to do this for this reason. Um, like maybe we need to have like we you don't want the game to be finished in one day, and so there, or you also you also want the game to be too easy. Like you want some challenges there, and so that might be initially unpopular, but it'll be important for the long term health of the game. You can tell players that this is what it is, and then have them come away feeling like they're not listened to, or you can uh, gather their feedback. You can respond in kind. Like uh, say indicating that like if you say thanks for your feedback, you might as well be saying uh, uh, I didn't listen to what you just said. Too generic. If you repeat the feedback, if you say, uh, if you re rephrase the, the feedback, and then uh, come up with different phrases that actually indicate that you listened to it and that you really will put it in front of the team. Like we tell people, oh, I'm going to go talk to the team about this, but we found that people didn't believe that either. Even told this all the time, but saying. Uh, hey, we're going to add this to the roadmap. There's no set time for it yet, but we see it as being important for this reason, and in part because of your email. Then that, even though the answer is still no, like the person comes away with it with a significantly happier response to it. Absolutely, and you know, as you touched on, like bad things happen. Like games get bugs, they crash. So how can your community and these players that you've served so well kind of help during a crisis? And. Uh, so that they, the good news is they can, and it's not just going to be your job to batten down the hatches and hold, hold people off while the team fixes it. Um, having the community help during a crisis starts in the weeks and months beforehand. And again, it gets back, like, we're, we're talking, I, as a brief aside, we're talking a lot about the negative sides mm -hmm. of it, but it's because we're, like, there's more of a support element yeah. to it, and this is when something that you can be working on the, the daily issue when you're working on a live game. And when you're releasing new content over time, like you, you're you moving fast because there's a lot to gain by getting something out there and making people happy with new stuff. Uh, but you have to prepare for that. Like if you assume that things are just always going to be awesome, then, uh, then you're not preparing properly. But if you're always talking directly to community members, you're going to align them to uh, you align them to you when things go wrong. Yes. And by having that steady, uh, so we spend a lot of time talking to influencers about how to report issues to us. Um, we encourage them not to send us specific things. Like if somebody writes into you and says, I'm having a problem, and you say, Matt, this person's having a problem, how can I help them? That ends up costing you a lot of time. But I would rather train you for saying, Matt, normally I get two people writing about this a day. Today I got 200 of them. Um, I believe something's happening, and here is the device information and all the stuff that you might need to troubleshoot it. Then suddenly, uh, we might have been working on it in parallel, but suddenly two things happen. One is I have a whole lot more information than I did before. The other is that you feel like you are involved in the solution. Um, it might be that it wasn't actually useful info. Like it might be that you were looking at the device type and it was actually the age of the device that we needed. And, but the simple act of, first of all, you providing that info lets us rule it out. But even if that doesn't end up being the thing, like you feel a strong sense of ownership and it triggers all of these amazing psychological heuristics where you now feel able to fix this and I'm going to go out and help people play it because I am now uh, helping to create this game. And it means that the, the other thing that makes me cry tears of joy at my desk is when uh, something is fixed and it might be a weekend or it might be off time and players thank us for putting in the time to work on it. So instead of feeling like something had been taken away from them, like they see you working hard, they felt ownership in the solution and they work with you rather than against you. 
We have a question coming in through Twitter, so we're just going to take a break. Do you work with kids' communities? So we do not. Um, we so historically we do have uh, like we had some breeding games in the past. We and we were more of a social casual space, mm -hmm. but our games have. Uh, even in the past, we considered our games marketed to adults who like cute things. Um, so for kids' communities, um, I, I would be happy to talk about that more offline, but it would more be, uh, I have not worked with them directly. It's more research in how are our game, uh, like how are our games different from those. Absolutely. And, um, we will uh, include Matt's Twitter handle on the follow-up, so you guys can connect with him and send him a DM if you have some more questions on that. Absolutely. Um, to get back into our questions, I know we're coming to the end of our half-hour time for that we've slated for today's webinar, but you, you were just kind of talking about how your community kind of really helps you with the roadmap, as well as like during a crisis. So how can a strong community, that, for example, your community that you've built, inoculate your game against problems? Um, yeah, absolutely. It it ends up being part of it is play. Mm -hmm. um, it's but and part of it is to it's really to talk. It's to talk to one another. It's to uh, talk to the company. And from a company perspective, there you have to be structured in a way to receive feedback. Mm -hmm. And this like it's a really obvious thing to say you should talk to your users <laughs> like of, of course of course you should talk to the people that are using your product but what is less obvious and what actually ends up taking up the majority of my time is that how do we set up processes so that as a company we can speak player mm -hmm. um, like sometimes internally we build ourselves as translators and that um, you might have uh, we we train our agents a lot in certain types of pattern recognition where you end up uh, determining the, the fingerprint of an issue. That it might be that if you get 100 people in an hour reporting something, it means this issue. If you get 10 people every, uh, 10 people reporting an hour over 10 hours, you end up having, like both of those appear to the product team as we've got 100 tickets about it, but they mean entirely different things. Like one might be that players are reaching it at a certain point in the game. The other might be that we pushed out a bad piece of content to a lot of players at the same time. So in that constant talking to players, it's making sure that um, are, we, are we sending, <laughs> we, we have a reputation as a department that sends a lot of email. <laughs> um, and that means we need to do things that indicates, are people reading our email? Yeah. How can we make people read our email? Should we be going over to somebody's desk and talking about something? Uh, one of the most important changes, like the biggest technology change we had in our feedback process was updating the support of the subject headers of these emails, mm -hmm. where instead of saying community support uh, feedback from 10, 22, 14, uh, it's instead talking about, like in the very first part of it, getting a headline that people either, uh, if it's important, it gets them into the email. And if it's not important, it just indicates that it is not, a, not an automated thing that's going. So setting up that structure so that the company can actually uh, hear what your players are saying instead of like people respond emotionally when when criticized mm -hmm. this this is a good thing <laughs> if you're not responding emotionally it means that like you're not taking as much ownership in your products and so how how do we manage that emotional response and say this is happening like mm -hmm. I'm having an emotional response to this but also uh, listen to the signal rather than uh, rather than uh, like get the signal from the noise um, let's, uh, Evan Hamilton, who's another community manager, um, have put it really, really well when he said ideal in, ideal in pain points rather than complaints. So you're going to receive a bunch of complaints and how do you turn that into a pain point and then how do you deliver that to the team? Great, Matt. Great insight. And, you know, we do want to be respectful of everybody's time, but there is one question that I want to kind of end with because it is kind of holistic and it does kind of touch on everything that we've covered today. What is a distributed community? And, and how should companies and everybody on the call today think about this when launching, you know, their programs? A distributed community is, uh, it's, it's kind of what it sounds like. It's So it used to be that when a company started a community, they launched it and they said, I'm going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, a, of dollars on a forum and a marketing campaign, hire a couple of people, hopefully, <laughs> and rather than, you know, hopefully they don't mm -hmm. give it to the intern. Um, 
and uh, it had a very if you build it they will come mentality um we we try to do it with a really lean team we don't want to overexpose mm -hmm. our team to uh like trends in the marketplace mm -hmm. uh, where and so instead uh, we we, we want to build our community across a lot of different channels. And so a distributed community means your presence on all of these different channels. It could be a really small presence. It might actually be that you comment once a week, but that gets noticed and seen. And simply being present there, uh, it gives that social cachet to the builders of that community. And it diversifies. Uh, we have some really wonderful writers and content creators. We have some really uh, wonderful people that like have a vested interest in attracting people to their community. And when uh, the hard part is trying to get them to um, not necessarily work together because they may have independent goals, but to make sure that they don't view it as a, as a zero sum game. Uh, so we will interact with the blog and as the blog grows, that means that the Facebook page grows and that it has the rising tide lifts all boats. And so uh, it's ultimately about viewing the community as an ecosystem rather than a single platform or a single hub that you're gonna see people going from one to another, to another, to another, that they may stop participating in this one. They may lapse all together, but then see a Facebook post that brings them back in. And when you interact with all of these people and give them your direct email address and have a mailing list to hit all of the most important influencers at the same time, you get this wonderful effect where uh, they go out and start building things that you never even thought of. And it, it makes you resilient. It means that if one community member, uh, if an influencer gets tired, um, you are not uh, like, that's their rights and you're not completely dependent on them for traffic. And it does that further uh, inoculation against if something goes wrong because ultimately you have advocates for the community across all of these different channels that it makes you look like you're superhuman and omnipresent, whereas really it takes a network of Google alerts and this and that alerts to make sure that you know what's going on. And then they uh, it, it aligns everybody to what all of you want, which is a good game that players enjoy playing and that sticks around for a very long time. Great, Matt. That, that's a great way to close off today's event. So um, on behalf of HelpShift, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. This, this is fun. We are so excited that you could join us. And as I mentioned, Matt will be part of our upcoming More Summit uh, on March 4th, which you guys will all be receiving an invitation to. So make sure that you mark off your calendar, 9.30 to 12.30 at the St. Regis. Uh, Matt, any, any final thoughts before we close out today's event? Uh, I, I look forward to seeing you all at the summit. Awesome, and be sure to join us next week. We will be closing out our road show next Thursday at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll be discussing things that gaming companies should be thinking about but aren't. So uh, we'll be sure to get everybody an invitation to that. And again, thank you, Matt, for being here, and we look forward to March 4th. Thanks, everybody.